Andrea Kalika, and I will be doing this talk about uh, big data with small computers, uh, building a Hadoop cluster with Raspberry Pis. Um, my background is I was a developer for a while, then I was a business analyst for a little bit, then I was kind of a mix of Hadoop administrator and data person. Um, now I'm the user of Hadoop and kind of doing some data analysis, data science-y kind of things. Um, so again, this is not going to be a super technical talk. It's going to be fun. I think that's probably good for like, I think this is like one of the first sessions of the whole conference. So um, hopefully it's fun and entertaining and uh, we'll give people some cool ideas because I definitely want to kind of do more things with this. So it'll be, it should be really fun. All right. So why did I do this? <laughs> um, it's fun, cheap, small, and it's possible. That was, I didn't want a server farm in my basement. I didn't want to combine a bunch of computers. I wanted to play around with Raspberry Pis because I've played with them before. It was fun. So it was like, okay, what can I do beyond um, flashing an LED or getting data from a sensor or doing stuff like that? So it also, to build this cluster, you will get a whole bunch of experience that you didn't know you're gonna get. Um, and it's, if you're a software person, you're gonna get a whole bunch of hardware experience. You're gonna get experience with some networking, um, different technologies, using the command line, all kinds of stuff. So it's kind of a more holistic way to learn everything. So, um, and yeah, kind of, you know, big data, Hadoop and Spark are buzzwords everywhere, but it's this fun way to kind of play around with those if you can get them to work. Um, so, example of Raspberry Pi, on the right, that's the cluster that I build. I only use three Raspberry Pis. I combine them together. Instead of um, using um, like a switch or something, I, use, I decided, not smartly, to use a Wi-Fi, and it's kind of weird and unstable and does really weird things. So don't, so don't do those things. <laughs> Invest in a good switch that won't break, and then use that switch. Um, so this is just examples of other people that look way better. <laughs> um, the, and kind of like my goals, basically. <laughs> Except that one, I like though that somebody did post a picture of that one on the bottom, I guess if you're looking at bottom right corner. There's so many cables. There's cables everywhere. They don't go neatly anywhere. They go everywhere. So I like that somebody posted kind of the real thing. Like that's kind of going to start looking like that until you refine that and then it, you add some LEDs and it looks really cool. So this is kind of, this is just some of the more manageable ones. People are putting like these huge clusters of like hundreds of, of um, Raspberry Pis together for either art stuff, for server reasons, whatever you'd want to do. Um, it's a fun way to kind of play around with stuff that normally is like enterprise level. Chances are your project is not going to be enterprise level, but it's going to be a lot of fun to do whatever it is that you'd like to do with it. So for me, it was Hadoop because that's what I work with. And so I was like, all right, it'd be cool to do something like that at home for fun. So, so Hadoop ecosystem, that's a lot of words, but um, so Hadoop is like a collection, uh, actually, let's, how many people work with Hadoop on a regular basis? How many people like play around with Hadoop because it's fun and open source? And <laughs> 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 okay, so like some of you, but it's not like a lot of you. So Hadoop is fun. Hadoop is open source, so it's free, which is really awesome because it's free. So you can do this without a Raspberry Pi. You can have a laptop or a computer, download some stuff, follow some interesting directions, and depending which tutorial you follow, because there's a gazillions of tutorials and everyone has an opinion of how things should be. So, but it's a lot of fun. It's a way to process data. And um, Spark and PySpark, Spark, so when you, when you use PySpark, it's part of Spark. So it's kind of like a really cool application that will help you um, analyze a whole bunch of data. And, um, and it's also part of Hadoop as well. But it's like people are saying it's going to replace Hadoop. But HDFS is a really cool concept. And it's like diving deep into it is kind of beyond the scope of this talk. But it's a really cool way. Um, it's fault tolerant. So you can kind of spread out your data over kind of 
old commodity hardware, which is really cool. So if something gets corrupted, like Hadoop kind of, HDFS kind of expects that servers are going to die. Hardware is going to die. Something's going to go wrong. So because you split it up in blocks all over the place, you have um, some kind of backups always available. YARN, it's an acronym. It's to, it stands for yet another resource negotiator. It's really cool. It does a lot of stuff under the covers that you don't have to worry about when you run a job. So it's kind of nice if you're trying to like run something like count this many words in this file or somehow analyze whatever data thing you have. Yarn is a thing that will like figure out how much CPU you have to do this, how much memory you have to do this, can you do this with whatever settings you've given it. So this is a horrible slide, but <laughs> it's, um, there is a ton of, so Hadoop ecosystem has a ton of stuff, and the green image there kind of splits them up a little bit. Because different things um, are used for different purposes. And that kind of is also, will put you in sort of analysis paralysis, because you're trying to decide what you should be using. Because there's a lot of cool stuff, it's open source, it's kind of available, there's probably a tutorial for it. You have to kind of decide what you're going to do. <laughs> so. And that might be really hard. And it, you might have to also decide where you, how you want to store your data. And there is kind of different data storage um, possibilities. Yarn and MapReduce, they kind of figure out how to process the data. Um, data access, you can do a ton of stuff. You can do machine learning. You can do anything you want. Scoop, if you want to take data out of like MySQL or something and put it into a NoSQL database, Scoop is there to help you out with that. And then you have like a bunch of stuff of like, you can schedule jobs with like Uzi, Flume, and Zookeeper keep track of things. So there's a ton of stuff. So <laughs> just keep in mind that there's like so many things that means also so many different hidden points of failure. Um, as well as there is a bunch of companies that make, th they try to make things easier and that's how they make their money. Um, all the way on the right, it's Ambari, but I think um, there's Hortonworks and Cladera Manager. So Hortonworks has Ambari, Cladera has Cladera Manager. They've merged, so it's now it's just one gigantic company. And what they've created is a way for you to do everything together and everything in kind of like um, an organized way. Because I'll show you how kind of cumbersome it can get. So. This is sort of a setup. I wanted to kind of go over that HDFS. It's a lot of stuff, a lot of kind of complicated things happening underneath that you don't really have to worry about um, unless you choose to. So um, there is a diagram right there. And it's kind of like it splits up a lot of data. There's like how different servers interact with different things. Um, the point is you take a bunch of data, you split it up across a bunch of servers. And if something goes dead or something like that, you always have that backup. So, um, and there, but there is a bunch of moving parts because different thing, different processes talk to different things. So you are dealing with a lot of things, but usually you don't have to worry about them because they're kind of um, obscured for you, which is kind of nice. Do you know how many copies of a particular chunk of data? You can tell it. You can specify it. Yeah, because it all depends also how many nodes you have. So you tell it your, I think it's replication number. So like if you're just using one Raspberry Pi or one server, it's going to be one because you can't replicate it to more nodes. So. Um, so this is kind of a little bit also if you are using Spark or if you are using anything to run on the cluster. So if you have a whole bunch of these nodes, um, you there's a bunch of stuff that's happening and everything always keeps talking keeps talking back and forth. So different processes keep talking to each other. So there's always this communication. And so that's another thing that you always have to keep track of. So you have to make sure that different hosts or different servers or different nodes are talking to each other and they're able to. Yarn is, an, this is a kind of more in depth understanding of Yarn. So resource manager, it basically um, figures out how many resources all the all the things in the system can have to run your job. So if you're doing a job, it will figure out whether or not um, there is enough CPU, there's enough memory for you to do it. Node Manager is very node specific, so it, it's basically a process that runs on every single node. 
And uh, there's Application Master, and that's more con basically controlling like your job. So it's kind of like a more, <laughs> it's every single one of these could be a talk in themselves. <laughs> so I try to like picture um, just to show that it's like there's a lot of complexity underneath, but it's um, a lot of it is kind of obscured, which is kind of nice. So one of the, okay, so this is the pitfalls. Compatibility. Um, Hadoop is a very active ecosystem. A lot of things get updated. A lot of things get changed. So you have to make sure that all your pieces are compatible because there is some stuff that won't run on some other stuff. Um, I had Java 11, but like things could only run on Java 8. So like you have to downgrade. And it's not apparent necessarily if you're downloading a bunch of things. So you have to do all that homework for all your components. So that's one of the things that you can get in trouble with. And the errors that you get are not very clear. <laughs> you will get something that's like something, something. And it's like, wait, no, what? And then you have to go to Stack Overflow and figure out what that means. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong just from compatibility issues. and. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's being deprecated. There's a bunch of stuff that they're being remo that they're removing. So it can get kind of difficult and kind of annoying trying to figure out what is compatible with what. But this kind of homework does pay off. Because if you know what's compatible, you know then, oh, this won't work with this thing. So before you build the cluster, this was one of the things that was a lot of tutorials touched on this. but. Um, so I think 2016, all the Raspberry Pis have SSH turned off. So that means you have to remember that and you have to turn that on because otherwise your node, your Raspberry Pi, won't be able to talk to other things. You have to do a whole bunch of stuff with bash RC to make sure the right variables are in there. And um, SSH was like bane of my existence. but um, Formatting micro SD cards, maybe it's common knowledge, maybe it's not. If the card is above 64 gigabytes, you have to format it a certain way. Um, the way I was doing it before with smaller cards didn't work, so um, the Raspberry Pi can't read those. Um, there's also a lot of tasks, um, a ton of tasks. The things that you're doing, you have to update a whole bunch of configuration files, and I'll show some of those. I won't go into a lot of it just because it's really boring. You're literally copying and pasting things into a configuration file, which is like a text file. And you have to make sure you copy and paste it right. So that's just another thing that if one of those is wrong, the errors get super weird and you don't know what's wrong. Um, and you always have to keep track of updates and compatibility. Like if something's getting deprecated, if something's like not going to be able to be used anymore, if something changed, so right now Hadoop, there's Hadoop 2.7, 2.6, I think. Let's see, which one are they killing off? Um, okay, not here. But like right now there's Hadoop 3, and there's a bunch of stuff that's new. And so you, and some of it is very small. Some of it is like they changed the name of, instead of um, master and slave, it's master and workers. So now you have to know that something's going to be named workers, not slave. So there's a bunch of stuff that's kind of underneath that you kind of have keep, to keep track of. Troubleshooting. So there's, uh, yeah, permission denied. It's like I thought my cluster had no security whatsoever. I thought it was all open. The passwords were basically the same and non-existent. But still, you will get some of those. You have to troubleshoot and figure out, is it the SSH keys? Did you have the right keys? Do all the hosts have the right keys? What's going on? Um, and sometimes the weird errors do come from the Java version. And sometimes your connection dies, and that creates a whole new level of errors that become surprising. How do you know it's working? Um, I'll show some screenshots, basically. So OK, you, you followed all these directions. You did all the things. There's a bunch of scripts that come with Hadoop. And um, if you say start DFS or start yarn, certain things should happen. Spark shell should just come up. Um, Spark version, so like Hadoop version, Spark version, things like that. If they show up, you're good. If they say Hadoop command not found, you didn't do it right. Um, there's also a whole bunch of UIs that come with Hadoop, which are incredibly nice. So these are screenshots, because that's the only thing I could get out of it. 
Um, so trying to, so you become kind of a network expert, not expert, but um, I don't know anything about networks. So I would taken it for granted. It was always set up for me. So um, I had to figure out some stuff and how different things work together and seeing if what's on what subnet and trying to figure that out. So I got to learn some command line tools for that. Um, the thing all the way on the right, if you type in Hadoop, a bunch of stuff should come up with a whole bunch of different um, options. So you're able to do a whole bunch of different things. Um, Spark, the same thing. And also on Spark, I don't know, does it look really weird? Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of like hello world examples in Spark. And uh, the one that you can't see <laughs> Um, involves taking a file, putting it into the HDFS space, reading it from there, and then printing out the first line of that file. That's kind of a common, um, basically, uh, hello world kind of version um, of Spark. Um, and also, let's see, how does that look? So the screenshot all the way on the right over there, it kind of shows, OK, you are able to actually put something into the HDFS file system. I put like the readme file there, and I was able to create a temp directory in there. So th and um, HDFS has its own commands. So that's another thing. They're kind of like Linux commands, but not quite. So then you have that other thing that you have to remember. Oh, this works in this, but it doesn't work in other environments, in other um, like this works in Linux, but for to get something to work for the um, to look at stuff at HGFS, you have to use slightly different commands. Um, there's a whole bunch of user interfaces. Um, another thing, so Hadoop three, all the ports are going to change, so that's going to be fun for everyone, <laughs> um, and that's going to be interesting because. Um, Hadoop 3 is going to be super powerful, has a lot of cool stuff, but that's going to be a problem for a whole bunch of people if they were not, if they hard coded them somewhere or like I forgot that that was happening. I, on my cluster, I downloaded Hadoop 3 and it's like, oh, that's not, not at all what I expected. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening. Um, there are user interfaces, which are actually really nice. This is a screenshot. So you can look at stuff that's not on the command line, which I appreciate. It just comes with it. You just have to know, um, I mean, where it's running on the port, and you're able to view it in your browser. And that's really helpful, because you're able to see how much space you got in HDFS. You're able to see if you run an application. So if you run a job, like you want to count the words, you want to do something, you're able to see, is it running? Is it finished? Is there another job running? Well, if you're sharing a cluster. but. Um, so you're able to see, and how, much, how many resources it's using. What I was trying to circle in blue, it shows you how many vCores you have available and how many are being used. Yarn is really also cool. It can create queues. So for example, if you want a job to be only in this queue with this much resources, it will do that for you. And then you're able to see, did you take up all the resources in that queue? And it's very visual. It's immediate. Like You can just look at it, and I like that. Um, I think a lot of people maybe prefer command line, but I, I do like the visual aspect of it because you can also then screenshot and send that to somebody really quickly and they understand what's happening. Um, like my job's not running, oh, you're using too much stuff, or oh, there's another job running and it's using all the resources, so you can't run your job. So those are really cool and really nice tools to see kind of what's going on with the cluster. Spark as well has um, a UI. This is just, you can use um, Juniper, Jupyter Notebooks for PySpark. Um, this is just an example. Um, and also PySpark, just all the complexity, that's kind of the data flow under it. So, But it's happening underneath. For the most part, like if you just wanted to start using Spark, you don't have to really worry about it yet until something goes wrong. But um, for the most part, you don't have to worry about it. So that's kind of nice. So this is just an example of PySpark. OK, it looks like it looks OK. Um, so when you download Spark, PySpark comes with. So you just have to make sure that you have the appropriate Python paths everywhere. But you're able to um, basically, this is also run some code and then print out some stuff. You can do it either in a shell or you can run um, Spark submit. So you can do it either way. If you're testing something out, the shell is really nice because you're just typing in things and it like processes them one by one. 
Um, I don't think I have screenshots of this. Hadoop is very noisy and very chatty. You will have a ton of stuff. It will tell you things you don't care or want to know, but you will know about them. So it will tell you every single thing it's doing. So keep that in mind if you're logging that it will take up a lot of space. And you can also disable a whole bunch of stuff because sometimes it will tell you errors that are like, OK, well, Raspberry Pi just doesn't have that. It's not a big deal. So even if you see errors, sometimes it might be not that big of a deal when you're running Spark or PySpark. OK, so this is just some of the resources. I don't have a GitHub or website or anything, but if you want to take a picture of this or something, or um, there's a whole bunch of different resources everywhere. Um, a lot of places, it's kind of like a rabbit hole. You will go to one spot, and then it will link to something else, and then it will link to something else, and it will link to something else. And you end up with now a whole bunch of stuff that like, and a whole bunch of different ways of how to create a cluster, different opinions of the, um, how secure your cluster should be, um, different opinions on how many users your cluster should have, different, all kinds of different things. But there's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of cool tutorials out there. Um, but I would always, um, try to remember that some of it is might be not um, applicable to the version of Hadoop you're trying to use because that will get you especially now that Hadoop 3 is coming out it's super new it has a lot of cool features but a whole bunch of stuff now needs to be updated or needs to be kept track of or something like that so it can be a little bit um, weird so I think this is the end of my talk. So basically, sorry if you were expecting something technical, but I think this is a good start. I'm sure there'll be a ton of technical stuff later on. Um, but yeah, I hope everyone was going to totally go out and build their like Raspberry Hadoop clusters because it's a lot of fun. It can add up to like hundreds of dollars, though, so keep that in mind. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know. But this is, I'm done. Again? Sorry, what? <laughs> so many things. Um, a bunch of SSH stuff didn't work. So there was a whole bunch of things. I kept getting permissions denied when it was totally open. I kept getting per so there was like a whole bunch of things that like for me not being a network person, I couldn't just like oh that's wrong. And at some point it worked fine. I was able to run Spark jobs on this, and then it stopped working. <laughs> so. Um, it was, for right now, it was just text files. In the future, I want to basically get a sensor, get data from like anything like temperature, anything like that, collect it all, save it somewhere, maybe on AWS, maybe just locally, and then just play around with it and display it. But I'm kind of trying to see what data sets I can play with. But step one, you have to get it to work first. So, <laughs> yes. It was okay. It did run. There's a bunch of things that, um, there's a bunch of tutorials that tell you to like mess with swap a little bit. So it, I didn't run into any problems, but I also didn't run that much. I didn't run jobs that were huge. I'm kind of excited about new Raspberry Pis with more RAM. So that's going to be kind of awesome. So I didn't run into like immediate, like you can definitely have a cluster started up and run with. Um, Raspberry Pi, I use Raspberry Pi 3, Raspberry Pi B, yeah. So it was not like, I didn't use the Raspberry Pi 4s at all. So like, I'm ex you're able to at least do a proof of concept with the current stuff without any problems. Yeah. It's just, it seemed like it was like a lot of random stuff. Like the ports are different. That was kind of big for me. But then the stuff, um, uh, one of the setup rules is like, oh, create, um, create this folder called slaves versus create this folder called workers or file. And it's like, well, that's going to make a difference because now it's named something else. So I haven't found any, any more. I'm sure there's more. 
Uh, not the ones that I've like looked into yet. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, I noticed there's some overlap, or it looks like there's some overlap between Hadoop and Spark. So what is the new thing that Spark does? It? It's more like Spark is supposed to be faster. Spark does a lot of its processing in memory, so versus in RAM, and versus I th uh, Hadoop does a lot of stuff. You have a lot of I/O interactions and stuff like that. And Spark has some sort of algorithm how it deals with data is way different. And so it's supposed to be faster. Everyone I've known that used it said it's faster and it's just nicer to use. And the fact that you can, I don't know, I guess you can do that too. So I thought like, oh, well, in Spark you can write in different languages, but in Hadoop, if you use um, something called, what is it? I think it's called Hadoop Streaming, you can write your code in any language and it will do. And you write your own map and reducers. and. So you can run jobs in any language you want. Yes. I haven't. I thought about that. I hope, but I have not. Uh, I've seen some tutorials where they've done that because you' gonna need them. Yes. <laughs> if you want to do anything, unless you're using, I think there's a way to connect it to AWS, but I haven't tried it out yet. No, but like that was one. At first, I wanted to because that act adds an extra layer. So now I have to know Ansible really well. I need to know all this, all this stuff really well. And I've studied Ansible and I've done a little bit, but it's like now it adds another layer. So every time you do something, yeah, it can do this thing, but also you might introduce some errors because now it's like, well, is Ansible going to give me provisioning <laughs> issues? Or like a versioning, not provisioning, ver like versioning issues. Like now this is another thing I have to make sure is up to date and will work with all the other things. So my thing was first just like get it to work. Do all the really boring steps and um, then figure out how to simpl simplify the steps so it doesn't take this long. Yes. Um, Raspbian? It was just like the one. I think there's like two others you can use on Raspberry Pi. I just went with the one that was like Raspberry specific. Yes. I didn't notice a huge difference. Um, but I think you have to, for me, when I used SD card size, it was like eight gigs that didn't work out. <laughs> so that was. Um, you need, I think I've seen the ones with 32, but I use 64. People were using 100 something or more because like it will take up some space just to put all the Hadoop stuff. So yes, go forth and make Raspberry Pi clusters. <laughs> okay.